On October 13, 2016, President Obama made one of his most controversial statements ever, although most will never even notice. Obama called for a ministry of truth to be formed. So how do we set up frameworks where we say, this is our time period where we're going to collect facts, and at the end of the day, we will accept the consensus of fact, right? How do we, how do, we do that in, in our, our current political enterprise? We're going to have to rebuild within this wild, wild west of information flow some sort of curating function that people agree to. Uh, you know, I use the analogy in politics. It used to be there were three television stations, and Walter Cronkite's on there, and uh, not everybody agreed, and there were always outliers who thought that it was all propaganda, and we didn't really land on the moon, and uh, Elvis is still alive, and so forth. But generally, that was in you know, the, the, the papers that you bought uh, at the supermarket right, uh, as you were checking out. Um, and, and generally, people trusted a, a basic body of information. Um, it wasn't always as democratic as it should have been. And it's always exactly right that, for example, on something like climate change, we've actually been doing some interesting initiatives where we're essentially deputizing citizens with handheld technologies to start reporting information that then gets pooled. They're becoming scientists without getting the PhD. And we can do that in a lot of other fields as well. But there has to be, I think, some sort of way in which we can uh, sort through information that passes some basic uh, truth, truthiness tests. Uh, and, uh, and, and those that we have to discard uh, because they just don't, don't have any basis in uh, anything that's actually happening in the world. And that's hard to do, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's going to be necessary, it's going to be possible. I, I think uh, the answer is obviously not censorship, but it's, it's creating places where people can say this is reliable. And I'm still able to argue about, uh, safely, about facts uh, and what we should do about it uh, while, while still uh, not just making stuff up. If you've ever seen or read 1984, you'll remember the Ministry of Truth, which is basically a bureau under federal mandate to determine which news is truthful and which news should be scrubbed from the history books forever. With similar systems of government-ordained truth taking hold in many socialist countries over the years, Ministries of Truth are not just some abstract concept. They're a brutal tool of oppression used by totalitarian regimes. If that's the case, then why is Obama suggesting that the United States of America starts using this massively oppressive tool? It turns out, Elite media think tanks have been calling for the exact same thing since at least 2010. On October 10, 2010, Marjorie Scardino gave a speech to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences which outlined the necessity for the very same sort of Ministry of Truth that Obama also said was necessary. News newspapers have, for the life of this republic and before, played a pretty important part in educating us as citizens and helping us to do that job. And so I want to talk a little bit about and think a little bit about the impact of the digital uh, world that we're living in and beginning to understand on citizenship and how newspapers feed into that. There's been, as President Bollinger uh, alluded to, a pretty feverish amount of talk over the last couple of years about the death of the newspaper. And I have to say that um, I think that obituary, though possibly a little um, premature, is a pretty solid prediction. I really do think it's true. If you are referring to that thing on paper that's folded and presented to you every morning without fail, uh, I do think that in most cases those kinds of things are fading. But I think if you mean the function of a newspaper, I think if you mean the idea of a newspaper, um, and you think that that's becoming obsolete, I can't agree. I um, do think that if you try not to call it a newspaper, if for instance you call it a report of everything that's happened in the world and what it means to you today, then that sounds pretty critical, I think. Um, it's just that the newspaper has changed form. Uh, it used to be that we said freedom of the press belongs only to those who own one. Now everybody owns a printing press. Now a large per portion of the world has access to the ability to, if they have a computer hooked to a network, create their own newspaper, create their own report of what happened in the world that's meaningful to them. They can blog it, they can tweet it, they, you can put up your views of, uh, for all of your thousand best friends on Facebook, you can make videos and podcast them or put them on YouTube, you can do broadcast emails with curated links, uh, you can do all of that. There is an astonishing number of ways that you can create your own newspaper now. So I don't think I have to tell you about all that. There are, however, I think, a couple of problems if we believe that that sort of news gathering is going to be able to sustain democracy, is going to be able to help us construct our national story as you would like it to, is going to be able to bring us information that we can trust. So maybe that kind of, of um, news gathering works if you take seriously the job of confirming what you should trust and what you shouldn't, and if you take time to discern the patterns. But there's a higher hurdle, hurdle to clear, I think, uh, and a much more complicated one, and that is, is the network that's defining your news able to achieve the task that it needs to? Is it able to do the job for you and democracy of scrutinizing the power structure and the people who inhabit the power structure? Can it really goad us into action? Can it really help us bring reforms to our society and to our government, those reforms that have taken us along as a democracy for so, so many years? Um, 
That is the thing I think that citizens have to be willing to do. They have to be free and able and willing to start a movement that fundamentally changes the, the uh, premises of the government. You might be wondering who exactly this Marjorie Scardino lady is and what exactly she has to do with Obama's calls for a ministry of truth. Well, when she gave the speech outlining the need for a top-down approach to bring about the fundamental change in the way our government operates, Ms. Scardino was the CEO of the world's largest publisher, Pearson. Pearson is mostly known for publishing educational books, especially those overpriced college textbooks that many construe as a racket. Pearson is constantly trying to figure out new ways to maximize their profitability. One of the ways they've done so is to get involved with the privatization of public education. Essentially, if they can force the government to buy their books for students, they'll have a guaranteed profit stream for the future. But as outlined in Scardino's speech to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, printed text is a dying medium. That's why Pearson has been leading the way in the next classroom revolution where they know they can cash in big educational technology. This largely untouched gold rush consists of educational video games or even tablet software meant to replace test books and standardized testing. Remember the Los Angeles School District iPad debacle that cost taxpayers billions and left them with Pearson software that was essentially useless? An independent report has found that an ambitious $1.3 billion program to provide an iPad or other device to every Los Angeles public school student has been slowed by technical challenges with curriculum that was supposed to be built into the technology often incomplete. The Los Angeles Unified School District launched the country's largest technology rollout of its kind in 2013 by vowing to equip each of its roughly 650,000 students with an iPad by the end of this year. But the rollout encountered problems, including students bypassing security measures to access prohibited content. Critics also complained about the process used to select Apple to provide iPads and Pearson to provide its built-in curriculum. Yep, that was engineered by Scardino and her gang, as was a bribery scheme in New York State involving a Pearson Foundation, which was paving the way for Pearson Publishing to capitalize on privatized education, which, well, the whole scheme eventually got shut down by the New York Attorney General, and Pearson amassed millions in fines. After multiple education-related scandals, Scardino was forced to leave her position as the CEO of Pearson and became the chairman of the notoriously progressive MacArthur Foundation, which has its hand in much of the nation's liberal media, including NPR and PBS. MacArthur Foundation has also thrown all its chips in with the education technology bandwagon and is currently partnered in a program called Glass Lab, which is meant to use data mining video games to completely replace all standardized testing. In 2011, Obama used his executive power to create a new job within the White House, dubbed the Fun Czar, which served as the official advocate for educational technology. This position was given to a woman named Constance Stein. The only problem was that Obama couldn't get the funding from Congress to actually pay the salary of the new fund czar. So he just had MacArthur Foundation pay for her wages and all of her expenses during her 18-month term. Don't believe me? Here's a video of her saying so. How is the White House spending their dollars for trying to increase the, uh, the impact of games? Is it, is it more on the, the research side or is it like giving grants to uh, independent developers? or How is right. that sort of being structured? So I assume you mean the agencies versus the White House, because by the way, my own salary is coming out of my own pocket of grants back at my home institution. So, yeah, yeah. so I mean the White House, and the awesome part about this interesting job is that we control no budget whatsoever. We have no budget. She clearly stated that her home institution was footing the bill, and a 2012 article in USA Today confirms that it was indeed MacArthur who paid for it all. So Marjorie Scardino, the woman who called for the Ministry of Truth at the elite think tank back in 2010, is also the chairwoman of the left-wing organization so powerful that it can have the president create a brand new job in the White House for their employees. Then, when they can't get the public funding for that job, they just decide to bypass all laws and democracy and pay for the salaries out of their own pockets, even though the employee was working an official position for the White House. To see exactly how absurd this whole arrangement is, just imagine if Exxon had President Bush create an heirs are position at the EPA where he appointed an Exxon employee. Then when he couldn't get funding for the position, Bush just decides to have Exxon pay for it all. The left would be outraged, but I guess it's all fine when you're just talking about a privatized takeover of the educational system. Here's where it gets even trippier. Marjorie Scardino isn't just the chairman of MacArthur Foundation. She's also on the Twitter board of directors and has been ever since she used her buddies at the New York Times to stir up a diversity scandal 
and shame the Twitter board of directors into letting her on. There's strong indications that after she joined said board, Scardina was behind Twitter's very own Ministry of Truth, known as the Trust and Safety Council, which featured many MacArthur Finance groups, such as the Dangerous Speech Project. These elites will stop at nothing to take over all aspects of culture and education. They have to control it all. From the moment your child first steps foot in school, to all the news and rhetoric that your child consumes at home through social media. Ever since Ms. Gardino has been on the Twitter board, they've tried desperately to roll out scheme after scheme to control the flow of information to the left's benefit. But it hasn't been working, and the populist movement has been rising up with ever-increasing momentum. Hatched by the corporatist publisher Pearson, Obama's sick plan for an Orwellian media landscape is sure to fail. The harder you crack down, the harder we rise up, Obama. So go ahead, create your ministry of truth, you globalists, you corporatists, you disgusting authoritarians who feel the need to control every aspect of our lives. The more you expose yourselves as the power-hungry loons that you are, the faster it wakes everyone up.